the operating system or compiler, whoever, has to keep track of, you have the call number one, and during call one, you call Mercer twice, that's call two and three, and during call two, you call again Mercer on a smaller thing, that's call four. So this entire stack of calls in the program counter there. <coughs> so, and then when you close those calls, you have to close them in the opposite order than you, you uh, open them. Now, that, that's all programming. We're not gonna discuss it here. But I want everybody to realize this is a recursive call. So before this function ends, it calls itself on half of the array. How many people are familiar with recursion calls? Hands up. Okay, so mostly everybody. If we need a little recap, you can do so, but we're not concerned in this class how do you actually implement or how many recursive calls you need to make. Now this is not a recursive call. This is an actual procedure. So I may have a separate function that's combined things. And we talked about this. I have to take advantage of the fact that R, L and R are what? Sorted. Sorted. Because combining things that are already sorted is quite easy, right? We start at the beginning, we see who's smaller, put it in the output, advance, and so on and so forth. So now how long this takes? The reason I recap this here is that I want to come up with a runtime. How do I measure the runtime of these recursive calls? Right? As a comparison, what did we do in selection sort? We say four, it's an array, right? Four i equal one to n. This is from one to n, right? How did this selection sort go? Find the max, you know? Uh, so say um, value equal minimum of a except block. Right? Because we're going to block some elements and then put the output of i equal that value and then block <coughs> that i. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't uh, block the index here. Uh, block the a of j so I don't re return it again. And then I keep going like that with n4 here. So at each step I find the minimum. I put it in my output, then I find the next minimum, put it in my output, then the next minimum, and I have to block those values to know next time I go through the array that that's already taken care of. I don't want to output it again, right? It's very easy. How did we figure out the runtime in here? We say, well, there's a for loop that's n things, and inside for loop, how long this takes? This operation alone. That's a linear operation, right? Finding the minimum is a linear thing. You have to go through the array to find the minimum. So if I do linear things n times, it's n times this of n squared. Because it's a for loop of n things, and each thing could be up to n, roughly speaking, n squared. I say roughly speaking because we need some formalism to show <coughs> truly that n squared. Now I can't do this in here, right? In a recursive function, I can't just say, how long is it going to take to do merge sort? Well, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out, right? That's my whole point here, measuring the runtime of merge sort. How do I know how long this takes? So anybody has an idea how to do this? I can't use that sort of mechanism. Hey, it's a for loop, n times, whatever it's inside, I get a number. So what do I do? This? How do I do here? Yes? Would it be n log n? Yes, but how do we get the n log n? Yes? Uh, is the left side and right side both log n time because it's binary? Splitting in half each How time. do I know it's log n? I mean, look at it. Do you see any log in here? It's like it's binary. You're splitting and you're doing binary. Right, it's split in half. Yeah. That's what you mean, and then reduced by yeah. half. That's a good intuition. But I want a more formal approach. <coughs> yes? So the final function t of n? If this is saying, if this is n, the input is n size, he's saying let's call this t of n. We don't know who t of n is, but let's say that's a runtime for Mercer. Then what? So t of n is equal to t of n over 2. How long this will take? If there's n steps in there, how many steps are in here? <coughs> Half, right? So that's t of n by 2. How about here? t of n by 2. And how about here? How fast can I do this combination? if they're sorted already. Mm -hmm. Linear. So that's something like this. 
So how do I round out this T of n? I don't have a formula yet, but I have a recursive formula. <coughs> 2 times T of n by 2, because I need to perform the merge sort for the halves, plus this. Now that's still not a runtime. It's a recursive formula. It's a recurrence, how we call it. And we need to solve this thing. We don't know how to solve recurrences yet. We'll find out pretty quick how to solve recurrences. It's not a big deal. But I can give you the answer. The answer is this has to be n log n. So solve. If anybody asks, hey, what you do? What is it? We have to trust Virgil for now on that solve issue, because we're going to get to it. But for now, I don't want to solve it right now today. We go to n log n. Any function that has this property, it's like n log n asymptotically. It could be n log n times a constant or plus a constant around, but any function with this property will, will come out as being growing like n log n, which is not as big as n squared, but definitely bigger than linear. So I'm going to put here n log n. Right? And the other stuff that. Um, that we did that I want to recap just a little bit, I showed you this, and I think that's important as a computer scientist to realize that. When we did insertion sort, uh, we had this issue with insertion sort, how that goes. <coughs> so it's four i equal one to n. We start with the array a. That's the thing. And I have here, say, output equal empty initially. And then I say for e i for 1 to n. Uh, I'm going <coughs> to write it very informally. Insert the element a of i into the output. The output has to be always sorted. So of course, if I do this n times, by the time uh, I return the output, that's going to be sorted. Remember how we did this? We have the output partially sorted, and we drag the next value to the current correct position. So one step in there that we did last time might have been if I have already 2, 3, 7 in the output, and somebody throws at me a, a 5. That's the next element from A, right? That's A of I, that's five. How did we insert five into this array? What was the actual mechanism to do so? Anybody remembers that? Somebody else. How did we move this five? Because this output array has to be always sorted. It's not all the elements, it's only the ones that I processed so far. How do we put this five <coughs> in the right spot? Somebody else. What's the mechanism? What kind of computer program do I need to write to move this five into the right spot? You guys remember from Tuesday? Because this clearly we did on Tuesday on the board. Yes? With, compared to the first element, With the last element, oh, the seven. And if it's smaller, I swap, right? Yeah. So I get two, three, five, five, seven, right? Swap. And now I compare again with the one on the left. And I don't need to swap, therefore I'm done. So that's a typical insertion sort, but I showed you a different insertion sort. That I was saying, this number here, this O of n squared, uh, theta of n squared, this corresponds to if I do, do use an array for the output. But I show you a trick. If, I, if instead of an array, I use a balance tree, what was the answer there? How much? N log n. Why was it n log n? The algorithm remains the same, right? It essentially inserts, but I do n steps because I have to do something for each element. But what's the magic with that tree? Insertion takes how long? This takes, this, this step in here, takes linear time in an array. 
or least. But if I do it in a tree, balanced tree. How long would it take in a balanced tree to insert an element in the right spot? If my structure is a tree, not an array. Log n. So this operation will take only log n if I use a tree. Therefore, since I do it n times, it's v n log n. The reason is a tree, this is the tree that we draw last time, balance tree, 6, 3, 0, 1, 7, 9, 8, 5. This tree we draw last time. In a balance tree, balanced binary search tree. What balance means is the depth. It's always about log n. In a balance tree, any branch from here to here is roughly the logarithm of how many elements you have. If I have a million elements, every branch cannot be more than log of a million. An unbalanced tree has very long branches and very short branches. Those are no good. But in a balanced tree, every branch is a ball logarithm. Binary search tree, by the way, means what? Balance or not, what's the property that this tree has that makes it a binary search tree? Yes. Yes. Which element to the right is bigger than the one above it? Which element to the left is smaller? Not just the direct one, the whole subtree. That's important. A binary search tree means everywhere you look, the left side, I'm going to say left subtree, is smaller than the value, the node value, smaller than the right subtree. It's an extremely important data structure in computer science, those, those binary search trees. See, everywhere you look, you look at the 7, you look at the 9, 8, anywhere, left subtree is always smaller, right subtree is always bigger. Now, that doesn't mean it's balanced, so you can have a binary search tree that's out of balance. That's why we need to add the term balanced to make sure if it's not balanced, how do I know the insertion takes log n steps? The insertion will go from the root down to one of these paths, will find the right spot, and will insert the element right there. But to guarantee log n time, I need to know that every path is roughly log n. Hands up who's with me. OK, that's where we were on Tuesday. And so the last thing I put on Tuesday was this formula on the board. And again, I'm not ready to solve it, but I will be next week. And uh, I'm going to get this runtime for Mercer. Now, because I'm counting on the fact that we're going to go very fast, I want to give you some honors questions before I move on. At algorithms, OK? I'm only going to post the questions, and you guys can figure out the answers. Those are not for credit. <laughs> so one of these questions is uh, Virgil sort. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. In version sort, I'm going to show you with an example. Um, here's an example. I want to sort the array, which is uh, 2, 8, 7, 1, 3, 5. That's my array, A. So I like to write it nice. 2, 8, 7, 1, 3, 5, 6, and 4. The algorithm, of course, works for any, uh, works for any array, but I'm going to do this one as an example. It's similar to merge sort. <coughs> That's what this one does. But it's not exactly merge sort. It picks a value, uh, say, random value. Uh, I'm going to pick the 4 in there. And then uh, it does for something that's called partition. I'm not going to describe the function. I'm just going to describe what the effect of the partition is. The function is not a big deal. I'm sure you can implement it. This function does the following thing. It looks at my array, and it puts 4 in the right spot, like 
I know 4 is going to be here, this value. This I'm going to call this pivot. And then it looks at all the other elements in the array. And without changing the order, the smaller than 4 go to the left, bigger than 4 go to the right. It's actually doing it inside that array. So it doesn't need to get another L array or right array. It just changes the array itself. Right? So if I start with this element here, uh, where's two goes, left or right? Left. So these are elements smaller than four. These are elements bigger than four. Eight goes where? Right. Seven. One. Three. Five. Six. And the four is the four, right? Everybody understands what this procedure does? It doesn't sort the array. It just puts the four, this four is in the sorted position now because all these are smaller than four and all these are bigger than four. Therefore, I can tell for sure the final sorted array, four is in the right spot. But this is messed up and this is messed up, right? So, so far what I did, I put four in the right spot, that's done. And I got the left side, the smaller than four, although not sorted. And the right side, the elements bigger than four, but also not sorted. So I, I didn't say how to implement this function, but you can see quite easily how to do it, because it's a linear function. You parse all these elements against four, move them to the right, to the left. You only need one parse to this array to get the job done. Isn't that just quick sort? Yes. <laughs> It is. So in quicksort then, <laughs> what did we do after we've done this? We got the four in the right spot, the left ones is smaller than not sorted, right side smaller than not sorted, then what? I have to apply the same mechanism as in merge sort, except I've done the, the linear part in before the recurrence calls. In here, I do the recurrence call half and half, then I do the putting it together. In quicksort, I do this partition first, and then I have to call quicksort on what? Right, from left side, right? So left side is what? Is the array from the beginning to the pivot. Right, this is the pivot here. And then I call again quicksort on the right side which is from the pivot to the end. This is the beginning. So this is the same array A that I've got. And that is quicksort. So what's the runtime of quicksort? This operation, I told you already, can be done in linear time. If you don't believe me, you can try to implement it. You only need a parse, one parse to the array once you know the value of the pivot and you, you can get it done in one step. But this is the like in merge sort. I can't say it's n by two, right? Because in merge sort, I knew for sure this is n by two. Each half has exactly half of the elements because the middle was exactly in the half. In here, if I pick the pivot, I'm not sure the pivot is going to end up in the middle. Like I picked this pivot nice in the middle, but I could have picked the pivot the one, right? And if the pivot is here, clearly left and right side are not n by 2 each. So I think I have to say the runtime, if this is t of n, the quick sort, just like in merge sort, recursively, this is t of how much? How much is from the left side to the pivot? 1, so n minus 1. Why n minus 1? Because the pivot is already out of the list. So it's uncounted. Right, but the right, but I don't know from the beginning to the pivot how many elements are there. <coughs> I think this is something like uh, pivot minus 1, and this is t of n minus pivot, right? Because this is how many elements I have here, and it's how many elements I have here. So I can't really write it the recurrence because I don't know who the pivot is. Depending on what value I pick, I get a different recurrence. So the t of n will be t of pivot minus 1 
plus t of n minus the pivot plus the linear time to do the partition. This is the partition time. So we don't know how to solve this equation. Again, trust me. It turns out that this recurrence cannot be solved as easy as this one. This one's an easy solve we'll do it next week. This one here has a different worst case with average case. So in the average case, we get a value. In the worst case, we get a different value. What would be the worst case if the only thing that changes on me are those pivots? Can you imagine what's the worst case? <coughs> Every time. So if the pivot is always all the way to the left or all the way to the right, not just the first time, all the recursive calls, how much space reduction I've got after, after taking out one element, how much I reduce the space with every call? One element. So the worst case, it's going to be n squared. <coughs> because I have to do it n times, and each time I have a linear time partition in it. In the average case, what's the best case? I can get. What do I need those pivots to be to get the nice, easy, what? Exactly in the middle, that's gonna be like Mersort, I chop the array in half, right? So if it's the average case or best case, they are the same, I get n log n. Again, I think you are able to process everything in here, it's totally fine, except for how to solve this equation. The average case solution for this equation, complete proof, it's a master level thing. We do it in the algorithms at the master level. But you definitely should understand quicksort and even implement quicksort, except knowing how to solve this equation to prove the runtime. Now, quicksort, you can say, merge sort is always n log n. Quicksort is on average n log n, but it could be worse. So merge sort in theory is better, because it's all the time n log n, even in the worst case. However, people like quicksort a lot. Most of the default sorting procedures are quicksort in many languages because it's easy to implement, very rarely gets the worst case. You have to have an <coughs> adversary to get the worst case. Unless the data is put by hand, uh, most of the time you're gonna get n log n. And it's interpretable, it's very fast, so on and so forth, so people like quicksort even though Theoretically, you can get the same bad running time like the selection sort. Now, one more thing. Insertion sort would be my favorite, except for balancing this tree. So th that could be a pain, balancing this tree. And you have to do it because otherwise the runtime is not guaranteed. But uh, they use something called red-black trees to balance this tree. That's another master level topic in algorithms. Binary search tree you're gonna study in your algorithm scores. But how to keep it balanced, that's a little tricky. Every once in a while, you have to check if it's out of balance, how do I balance it? So that's one thing that I want to say. The other things are two questions that came up during office hours, I interview sort of questions. I'm going to put them here for you to think about, but not the solutions. So one of them is, I have, here's a problem. Two lists, uh, linked lists. that intersect. So what you are getting is the head A, that's a memory address, that's the first element of this list, and then uh, here's how this link goes. And here's another list, that's head B, So at some point, they point to the same memory address. This is an object, could be a song, could be a number, could be anything, a web page. You have those two lists. I think you know how linked link lists work. There's a memory address. Every object has its own value, whatever you want to store it there, like could be a number or a name, but it has a pointer to the next element. So if you look at those pointers, eventually the list terminate. Once they intersect, they have the same memory addresses. So you have to find the intersection. How do you, knowing head A and head B, how do you quickly find this intersection here? 
I know you can do it brute force, just fix this one, compare with everybody, fix the second one, compare with everybody, that will be n times n runtime. Is there a faster way to do This was an interview at Facebook question for quite a while, but now I think it's too popular for, for it to be an interview question anymore. So think about that. And the other one that, um, do you have any notes from yesterday? What was that array? Yeah. Um, so here's an array. I forgot the example, but maybe he has it. Eight elements, maybe? I think so. What was it? No? I'm looking. Um, so I think that was a seven, eight, let me see, five, three, one, uh, nine, two, and six. Let's, let's try this one, something like that. This is, this is what is given to you. This is, again, in an array, I write the values of the array inside and the indices if you want them outside the array. Uh, this is your job to create the following output. For every index i, produce the most recent a value that is at least as great as a of i. So here's the output, what I'm, I want to get back. There is no recent value, because recent means previous value. There's no recent value greater than seven. There is no recent value greater than eight. What's the most recent value bigger or equal to five? Eight. How about the most recent value bigger or equal to three? Five. How about one? How about nine? Nothing. How about two? No. Nine. How about six? No. That's what you have to produce. So you, when you traverse this array, for every element, produce the most recent value that's at least that big, if there is one. This is a problem for my algorithms exams at the master level. So in a CS 5800, I give this problem. And of course, you can do it in n square time. That's trivial. For every element, go back until you find the most recent value that's bigger than it. That would be clearly n squared because you have to do this for all n elements, n times n n squared. Question is, can you do it faster than n squared? So you have two problems that are beyond the level of this class if you want to think of something interesting. Now, I want to talk a little bit about these functions here. More formally, what this symbol theta means. <laughs> So how do we deal with this asymptote times? So we say a function f is, uh, I'm going to say, theta of another function g um, is O of another function, uh, I don't know, h. and it's omega of another function L. So here's what I mean by that. When I say theta, I mean f of n is between two constants of g. So for example, if n squared is uh, if n is, uh, you know, half n squared plus 2n minus 5, g of n would be n squared. Because half of n, n squared plus 2n minus 5, is between some constant of n squared and some other constant of n squared. The constants, you can pick any constants you like. But because they're constants, you can only pick them once. Is there a constant that makes this work? Can you give me a constant that makes n squared bigger than this? Two, one, three, seven. A lot of constants will show that n squared is bigger than this value. 
above C2 is there a constant that makes this smaller than half of n squared plus 2 n minus 5? Again, you can pick any constant you want. What constant would you pick? Zero. No, zero you can't, sorry. <laughs> C1 and C2 have to be strictly positive. So you have to pick a constant that's a little bit bigger than zero. Can you pick one? Right, 0 0.001. And this one could be 100, I don't know. So that means F and G have the same asymptote, because we don't care too much about those constants. And you can show that if F is theta of G, then G is theta of F, because they have the same asymptote. Now, the sides are only half of it. So to be H of N, I need f of n to be smaller than some constant times h of n. So it could be the same asymptote or much bigger. For example, I could say n squared is uh, O of n cubed. Is that true? Can I find a constant times n cubed that beats the n squared? One, two, three. <coughs> Can I say n squared is O of uh, O of 2 to the n? That would be equivalent to say n squared is smaller than some constant times 2 to the n. Can I find a constant that makes this happening? Of course I can. 2 to the n is a huge function. Well, actually, it works with any constant. Any number you put here, even 0 0.00001, eventually 2 to the n times that constant will beat n squared <coughs> because it's an exponential and that's a polynomial, right? How about, can I say um, f of n equal n log n, that's Mercer, is O of n squared. Can I say that? Is n log n smaller than a constant times n squared? Yeah, one, constant one, right? The other side is the opposite. A constant times ln, this function, has to be smaller than f of n. Could be the asymptote, h, this l, could be the asymptote, or a smaller function. So you could say, uh, my f, say n squared, would that be correct to say omega of n? Is n squared bigger than n times a constant? Can I say n log n is omega of n? Is n log n bigger than n times a constant? Right. Uh, can I say um, n squared plus 5n plus 3 is theta of 3n squared? What that, what that means, means I have a constant times 3n squared that's smaller than n squared plus 5n plus 3. Is there such a constant that I can put there to make this work? What constant? Yeah, 0 0.01, for example, right? The reason I know this is true because those two functions are actually not in an omega relation. What's the proper relationship between them? I mean, they have an omega relationship, but the real relationship between those two functions is what? Is the theta relationship. Both two functions, both 3n squared and n squared plus 5n plus 3, are theta of what? n squared. So because they have a theta relationship, they mean asymptotically the same. Of course, they're going to have gamma, and they're going to have the O relationship, too. You can see everything that works with theta is going to immediately work for O and omega. So that's why people, when they know the theta, they don't bother with <coughs> omega and O. Because if I can have a theta, that's much more exact than just one half of it. We call this low upper bound. We call this lower bound. And this we call this asymptotic the same.
So if you look at the graph, here's my f function. An upper bound, it's bigger. That is the h function. A lower bound is lower. That is the L function. And uh, a G function that's asymptotically the same might be around there. That's a G function. Same as F. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be that close. It means they have to be within constants of each other. Some part that I, I didn't put in here to not get drag down into details is that the same like with limits those properties don't have to happen from the beginning if you recall the homework six the infamous homework six limits problem <laughs> it says some property needs to happen to have a limit but not necessarily the beginning of the sequence right there was an n zero there a starting point at which it starts happening same thing in here the beginning could be wild whatever it doesn't matter if this happens at some starting point, then it's good. So in principle, this, this f function, right? I'm going to erase it. I'm going to say the f could be something wild in the beginning. As long as at some point f becomes some reasonable behaving function, that's fine. Because it just after some n0, this is, say, this is n0. At this point, it starts behaving properly. <coughs> Even though in the beginning, it doesn't satisfy the lower bound or the upper bound, it goes up and down, that's okay. When we talk about asymptotes, we mean they start happening at some point. <coughs> and that was with me. Okay, so this is easy stuff uh, that the regular section spent like two lectures on. Um, uh, here are some examples, like let's figure out what's up with these asymptotes. You're gonna get questions like this. What is the proper relationship between 2n and 3n. Which one of these operators I can put there? Theta, right? Because it's the same asymptote. How about between n and 2 to the n? Is a theta bound? No. This is all off, right? It's smaller or equal than. How about n squared? versus n squared plus n, theta. How about um, n at one half versus uh, n? This is like the square root, right? Is it a theta bound at the square root of n and n within constants of each other? Yes or no? no. So which one is this an O or theta or omega? What do I write? O. Oh. How about square root versus the logarithm? Are they the same? Are in a theta relation? Omega. Oh, omega. Omega. You think the square root is bigger than logarithm? Like asymptotically bigger. Maybe. <laughs> How about n at 100 versus 1.01 1 .01 at power n? <coughs> Which one is bigger, do you think? 1.01. This is bigger, right? Because this is an exponential. <coughs> While this is a polynomial. So this is what? O of. When I say omega of, it means bigger than what's inside the omega. When I say O of, it's smaller than. Okay. How about, uh, I don't know, um, there's some ones in here, it says n square log n versus n log square n. By the way, in case you don't know, this is n times log n times log n. Log square. Log, it's not log of log, it's log times log. So which one is bigger here? Or what's the relationship? <coughs> is it a theta bound between them? Which one is bigger, this one or this one? This one's bigger. 
Hands up to follow this stuff. <coughs> so when you get a problem with this thing, don't try to guess it. Put it in the constants. Play with the constants. You know, that, that's the easiest way to not get it wrong. If you're not sure, like in here, I would say, okay, I'm not sure. I need n squared times log n to be constant times n times log n times log n. Log n goes to log n, square goes to the n, and now I have n constant times log n. This, this the relationship is asymptotically bigger. A polynomial will always be the logarithm. An exponential will always be a polynomial. How about the factorial? What's the relationship between n factorial and 2 to the n? Which one is bigger or are they the same, asymptotically speaking? Yes. N factorial is bigger? Like that? Yes. Okay. So if it's bigger than 2 to the n, will also be bigger than any polynomial, right? Because 2 to the n is bigger than any polynomial. Right? All right. So uh, that's what I think we have to do with these um, functions. Do we have time, do you think? We do. Let me show you one more cool thing about these algorithms. And you get to tell me what's the runtime. I have another virtual sort, version 2. Okay. So that one didn't go through. It's quick sort. Here's another one. <laughs> How about this one? I'm going to show you an example. I have the following numbers. 78, 17, uh, 39, 26. 72, 94, 21, 12, 23, and 68. So I know the range. Some, somebody told me it's probably a range between 0 to uh, 100. <coughs> or I guess the range, somehow. It's not part of this problem. Now what I do, I design a um, Let's see, one, two, three, four, let's say uh, K buckets um, of size. So zero to max is the range. Max is 100. Uh, of size, max divided by K each. So here's how it's going to look. From zero, the first bucket it's going to be up to, say I do k equal 10. This is 0 to 10. Then the next bucket is to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So these are my buckets. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Uh, it's always including the left one on this side and excluding the one on the right side. So now I do a linear pass through the array to put each value into its bucket. So 78, where does 78 go? <coughs> goes here, right? How about 17? Goes here. Next one, 39. Why is this a linear pass? Can I just put a value by the value? I know 39. Can I put it directly in its own bucket? I don't have to do a search. I don't have to traverse anything. Can I just, from the value 39, figure out that goes to that bucket immediately? Can I? So I can do it in constant operation per item, therefore it's a linear search, because I have to go through every item. Yes? Doesn't it take n time before that to figure out what the range is of it? Or do you the range from 0 to 100, or the range of a bucket? The range from 0 to 100. Let's suppose I know that somehow. <laughs> I'm going to save that for later. Let's suppose I know, for example, if I deal with people's salaries, I know they are between, I don't know, 0. <laughs> to 300,000, right? If I deal with people ages, I know, you know, students are between, I don't know, 
17 to 25. So I can draw a little bit bigger range just to make sure. But in some problems, you're right. In some problems, range could be an issue. Like if I don't know how big elements can be. Um, what's the next one? 26 goes where? Here, right? 72 goes here. 94 here. What else? 21 goes in here. 12 in here. No. So here maybe. 23 here. 68. Is that right? So that's a linear pass. Now I sort values in each bucket. Say with insertion sort. Or your favorite, selection sort, merge sort, whatever you want. That is only in this bucket. So I'm not, I'm not doing it across buckets. I'm just saying, sort these values here. There's two values. Sort these values here. This nothing to do, nothing to do, because they're empty. Sort this value, it's one, so I don't do nothing. Sort these two, and so on and so forth. So I sort them per bucket, and then I declare that I'm done. Because I know these elements are smaller than these elements, smaller than these elements. So I read the buckets from left to right. And in each bucket, I have them sorted. So that's it. I sort the elements, right? So the job is, your job is, what is the right k? If you know the range, if somebody tells you the range, max, what k would you use? That's one question. What's the assumption <coughs> of data values in terms of distribution to make this a good method. I need a certain assumption, otherwise this method is not buying me anything. But if the numbers have a certain characteristic, these values, then it's a good method. And what's the running time? Meaning data of something, right? Is this better than merge sort or insertion sort or something, or it's just the same? That's the question, which I'm not going to answer. But I have another question. Anybody knows the name of this thing? Yeah, sorry, bucket sorry. Bucket sorry. <laughs> I thought it was Virgil sort. All right. I have a third version of Virgil sort. <laughs> Let's see if you guys know that one too. But the running time of this one with some assumption in the right K, that's an interesting thing to know. Uh, was an interview question. Here's the last, my last sorting method I have. Uh, I'm going to say, here's the numbers I have. Here's the array A, 3, 2, 9, 4, 5, 7, 6, 5, 7, 8, 3, 9, uh, 4, 3, 6, 7, 2, 0, 3, 5, 5. I'm going to first sort these things, sort by last digit. But I'm going to use a stable sort. Everybody knows what stable means for a sorting method? Stable means items don't get swapped unless they have to be swapped. In other words, look at me here. If I sort by the last digit, I have a 9 and another 9. I could keep the order or reverse the order of those two 9s because they are all, all the same, 9-9, nine, nine, right? A stable sort says, if you don't have to swap those two, which is my case here, this nine or this nine, leave them in the order that they are. So stable sort means don't swap if you don't have to. <coughs> Some things have to be swapped. Nine versus seven, these are in the wrong order, right? Just looking at the last digit, seven has to go first. So if I sort them, which one goes first? By the last digit. 720. What else? What's next? This 5? Is that right? 355. Five. What's next? I have a bunch of 7s here. No, 6. 436. Six. Then I have two 7s. Do I have to swap those 7s? No. 457. 657. Six. 
and then I have two nines, three two nine and eight three nine, right? And then I do the same stable sort by ten digit. Again, I don't swap things that don't have to be swapped. So I'm only looking at the middle digit now. Which one goes first? I see two, five, three, five, five, two, three. Which one goes first? Two, this is good, right? Seven to zero goes first. Then the, what's the other two? Three to nine. Now I'm done with two, so I go to three. I have four, three, six, right? And eight, three, nine. Four, three, six, eight, three, nine. I'm done with the threes now. I have what? Three fives. So I, I don't swap the order. I have three, five, five, four, five, seven, and and finally stable sort by hundreds digits. Digit. Do the same thing. I don't have swap. I don't have to swap things unless the digit is in the wrong order. So what do I see? Seven, <coughs> three, four, eight, three, four, six. Which one goes first? Three, two, nine. The next one is three, five, five. The next one is four, three, six. Yeah. Six, five, seven. I declare done. I saw the numbers. So now one can ask, what's the advantage of this method? You actually sort them three times, right? Why not just sort them once? The thing is, I can implement this in linear time. I won't say how, but this sort can work in linear time. So the actual runtime of the whole thing, it's going to be linear time for each sort, because each sort is a linear time, times how many digits I have, right? Because I sort for each digit. So how many digits are there? Number of digits. Now, of course, the number of digits, I can change the numeration base. If I don't like base 10, I put base 16, I get different digits, right? But then the sort will be in base 16 or base 2. Anybody knows the method, the name of this method? Radix. <coughs> but what we didn't say for Radix sort, what is this magic sorting procedure that runs linear time in here? For that, you'd have to take the algorithm class. It's not something I can do in two minutes. It, the name is counting sort, but I, it takes a while to figure out how it works. Uh, one more thing about algorithms, and then we talk about easy stuff. Any search based on comparison it's at least log n time. And any sort based on comparison it's at least n log n time. This is a fundamental theorem in computer science. I'm going to do the sorting one. It says you cannot implement sorting in general faster than n log n, no matter how hard you try if your sorting method is based on comparisons. In other words, if inside the sorting method, the way you make decisions, what's the proper order of these elements, is based on comparison. <coughs> I don't know if we still have that. <coughs> so if you recall uh, insertion sort, for example, what's the key inside the insertion sort? It's going to ask, is this number bigger or smaller than this other number to swap? 
or the selection sort, the key is to find the minimum at each step that's based on comparisons. All these sorting methods are based on comparisons. So what this theorem is saying, it's saying merge sort is optimal. You can't do faster than merge sort, asymptotically. It's important to know that. Although some methods could do a little faster, bucket sort is faster, radix sort is faster. They either make an assumption about the data, so it doesn't really work for all values, or they don't use comparisons. The reason radix sort is fast is because this magic method here that I didn't say, I just say the name, counting sort. Counting sort is not based on comparisons. It does something else, it's based on counting. So we want to prove this part here. The proof is easy if you wrap your mind around it. Wrapping your mind around it may be a little tricky. So I'm going to take a, a sort based on comparison algorithm. And I'm going to map in a tree all possible runs of algorithm on an input of size n. So in other words, I start in here. For this I have my input array from 1 to n. This is my starting point. This is where my algorithm starts. Because this algorithm is based on comparisons, the first thing it's going to do is going to do compare something. It's going to take two elements of this array and compare them. And depending on that comparison, it might choose to do something else. Right? It might be this is A1 is bigger than A2, and this is A1 is smaller than A2, for example. And now in here, my algorithm is going to do a different comparison. And in here, a different comparison. Now, of course, for different inputs, different arrays, it's going to go to different branches because it depends. This is. This shows all the possible runs of the algorithm, right? So it's going to do another comparisons and another comparisons, and you know, here it's going to do another comparison and so on. So forth. at some point, at some point, every branch will terminate, will say stop, and will output the order. Right? It's going to say I sorted the array, I have it in order, I'm good. Some branches may take longer than other branches. Some branches will stop really early, maybe. Some branches will go all down. Because some, some runs will take more comparisons than others. Sometimes you're lucky. If A1 is bigger than A2, and A2 is bigger than A3, and A3 is bigger than A4, you don't have to compare A1 with A3, and so on and so forth, because the, the comparisons have a transitive uh, principle. Right? My point is this. How many leaps do I need to have in this tree? This is all possible runs of the algorithm. How many possible order outputs are there for any input of size n? How many possible orders are for these elements? Could be a1, a2, a3, a4. Could be a3, a2, a1, a4. Could be a4, a3, a1, a2, so on and so forth. Right? Any, any order is possible. I'm, I'm trying to sort the array. So array is given to me from 1 to n. But the output order could be any sequence of those indices, right? So how many possible outputs this algorithm must have? Yes. N factorial outputs. I'm saying that because you can see for different arrays, you may have different orders that you need to output. So now my claim is the depth of this tree I don't know what the algorithm does inside. I have no clue who compares to what and what's the resulting you know, procedure after that. Could be merge sort, could be insertion sort. The depth of this tree has to be such that the number of outputs is n factorial. There was a theorem in your recitation. Remember that? This is a binary tree, because any comparison can have two or three outputs, say binary meaning equal or smaller or higher, right? Two outputs. Remember that thing from the recitation paper that says, in any binary search tree, I think we did it in class, in the recitation class. 
we were saying in a binary tree, what was it? The depth has to be at least log base two of the number of nodes in the tree. Remember? And we did it with strong induction with two subtrees. That's true for any binary tree, whether it's a binary search tree or an algorithm tree or whatever, it doesn't matter. Any binary tree has this property. And I say the number of nodes, those are all the nodes, that's more than n factorial because that includes the intermediary nodes in here. But I have n factorial just outputs. So this equation, if you solve it, I want you to prove that depth, if this is the, it's got to be at least n log n. Or some function that asymptotically is like n log n, could be half of n log n within constant. So that requires a little bit of arithmetics here because I have the depth, sorry, logarithm of n factorial. How did I prove this theorem? Assuming you guys do the arithmetic here. I say, look at all the runs of this algorithm, all possible comparison sequence that it could make for an input of size n. All those runs, a run it's going this way, that way, this way, that way, until it reaches a stop, which means it sorted my array. Different arrays will cause different runs in this tree. I know I, I have at least n factorial outputs to be correct because that's n factorial possible sorting outputs. So my tree has to be deep enough to allow n factorial outputs. I use the recitation result that says the depth has to be log of number of nodes that is at least n factorial. And here if you solve this equation, log of n factorial, I think you're going to get an asymptote that's n log n. The actual function is not n log n, but asymptotically it's like n log n, within constants of n log n. So this shows that any sorting algorithm based on comparisons that takes branches depending of is that bigger, is that bigger, will have to have the running time at least n log n. Radix sort, bucket sort, and other methods run faster than n log n because they either not based on comparisons or they make certain data assumptions that says I only works that fast assuming the data has this characteristic. This says it has to work all the time, no matter what the data is, no matter what the uh, lucky or unlucky you get. So if you finish this, try to prove it for the search same exact way. That's all I have to say about the algorithm. So now, we're going back to, uh, some of this stuff is, is uh, in the honors uh, material in the sense that I don't think you're going to have any questions related to this, but this would be quite useful when you take the algorithms course, because then it's required. Uh, same with those problems, you need to know bucket sort and radix sort right now, but when you implement right programs and you go to the algorithms course, it's quite useful to know these other sorting methods, how they work. If you do data science, in data science, data assumptions are critical. In order to solve those problems fast, you need to know how the data is distributed. It makes a huge difference if you get the distribution right or wrong. So applying the right sorting technique, for example, bucket sort, for the right data could save the day if you deal with a billion customers. Because these numbers, these asymptotes, they're not that different when they're small. n log n versus n squared. It's not a big deal if n is 10 or 20, but if n is a billion, how much is n log n if n is a billion? Log of a billion is roughly in base 2. It's roughly 10 to the 9 times 25 or something. And how much is n squared? 10 to the 18. So you can see how much bigger that is. If you have a lot of customers, it makes a big difference what sorting method you use. Okay. Uh, questions about this theta and big O and omega? you know, compare 2 to the n to 3 to the n, for example. What is the right, what is the right function here? That you're gonna get as part of your 
quizzes and exams. So that's absolutely required to understand how this works. What's the right thing here? <coughs> hmm? is, it, is it theta? Is 2 to the n the same asymptote as 3 to the n? Is 2 to the n within constants of 3 to the n? Can you find the constants? What constant would this be? 1. What constant would this be? Is there a constant multiplied with 3 to the n to always be smaller than 2 to the n? This C2 will have to be smaller than 2 to the n by 3 to the n, right, by doing the division here. Is that possible? No. The only constant would be 0, but 0 is not allowed. So that means I've got my sign wrong here. What is this? Oh, right. 2 to the n is smaller than 3 to the n. Always play with those constants. Don't guess it. Put the constants in and actually figure out the constants. To be sure, the most sure way to be sure you got it right is to say C1 is 1 and C2 is 0 0.05, and that works. That way you got it for sure right. Now, I love algorithms. I would spend another week on them. It's my favorite class to teach. I'm going to teach in the summer, the master ones. And you're welcome to sneak by to see how that looks like. I'll, I'll give you a recommendation for which lectures are worth you know, attending. Uh, but I have to move on, unfortunately. And uh, we're moving on to really, really like, if you felt like before we're going all the way back to high school, and sometimes to elementary school, now we're going before you even went to first grade. <laughs> That's far of back we're going now. So what's the alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> see? See how far we have to go. What is it? H, I, J, N, O, O, P, Q, R, S, G, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. What is it? W, X, Y, Z. Why is it that you got it? So now, let's say, could you, could you elaborate? <laughs> so now let's say I want to map those letters into numbers. I say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Right? Okay. Uh, so, people have this particular problem, which is like a motivation for why we start talking about Mathematica. <coughs> is from, from thousands of years ago, which was the basic cryptography, not the modern cryptography, but they want to transmit text as in letters, because they didn't, there was no text, it was just letters. <coughs> but in a way that if somebody intercepts a letter, they can't figure out what's written on it, right? So they didn't know mathematics, and they didn't understand that cryptography or security has to do with math. So they come up with some heuristic to do so. A famous heuristic is called Caesar. Caesar cipher or encryption. That was a very basic thing. They were saying, uh, you know, what I'm going to do, so, cipher, it's saying, I want to keep the text, but I'm going to move any letter plus three. That's what I'm going to do. When I, I, my scribe will take my letter, which is written in normal language, and will move any letter three characters forward, right? So if I get Virgil, how would that read? Who's V plus three? V plus, let's do plus three, right? So this is Y. I plus three is who? L. 
R plus 3 is U. U. G plus 3. I plus 3. L again, right? L plus 3. How much? O plus 3 per letter or per character. I, I think it's pretty obvious how this cipher goes. You look at this table, you have this table, and you move everything plus 3. Now, Julius Caesar thought, oh, that's amazing. Nobody would understand what this is, right? <laughs> That was his purpose, to say, if somebody, sees, he, he looked at the scribe letter, right, he wrote a letter, and the scribe translated and said, perfect, this is completely undescribed, you know, like, you can't figure out the text. And he was right for a while. People were surprised, hey, they intercepted the letter, because spies existed before the alphabet, you know. So people intercepted those letters, and like, I have no clue what this is. Like, they didn't even know it's a letter. But what happened is, once enough people intercepted enough letters, they figured out there's something going on. This guy sends letters because he's the king or the emperor or something. He must send letters. And he sends these, these writings that make no sense. There's got to be some mechanism for the person on the other side to read this thing, right? What's the point of sending these pieces of paper with random characters on them? There's got to be a way on the other side to read this stuff. So once people knew that, that there is a way to read it, it's quite easy to figure out how to reverse this thing. I mean, we know how to reverse it, right? What do we have to do to reverse this? Minus three. So the only mystery in here is the three, right? Is it minus three or is it minus five? What, what happens if I take Virgil, but instead of that, I add five to it? What Virgil becomes? V becomes? Right, so there's a trick here, V plus 20, plus 5 is 26, I have no 26, right? So what do I do? I back to the beginning, right? So I, okay, B becomes A, I becomes N, is that right? And then R becomes G, L, I again is N, right? And L is? So once people figure out the Caesar and the scribe are using the plus some number, they change the number sometimes. They only figure out how to go back, but that's very easy, right? If you know it's that kind of cipher, if you know that, how do you know how to go back? Trial and error, and you don't need many trials because most of them makes no sense, right? Only the one that's the actual offset, three or five, will start making sense. You see how these characters, if you try minus four or minus three, you don't get something that makes sense. But as soon as you try the right one, everything makes sense. So from one letter, you can guess the offset. You don't need multiple letters. You just get one letter and say, OK, try minus three plus three minus five plus 17 minus 17. Eventually, it was clear that only one makes sense. So the whole cipher encryption thing was completely useless. So let's, uh, in order to do this table, like you guys said, with plus five gets to eight, that's a trick here, right? V, which is 20, what, one? Plus five is 26, and 26, it's like zero, right? What is this here? It's going back to the beginning, right? So that's a modulo operation. So to, to see this going back to the beginning thing, it will be more useful to draw this table in a different way. Say, here is the modulo 26 round. This is 0. That is A, 0. B is 1. C is 2. D is 3. What is, uh, what is it, 13? N is 13, M before it was 12, and the last one is Z, that's 25, and W, sorry, Y is 24, and so on and so forth, right? 
So I think if you see it this way, it's really easy to see what's going on with this plus. If I, if I add y plus 5, I'm going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm going to get to d. Right? And minus, in here what I want to point out this way, if I do y plus 5, I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I get d. And if I do d minus 5, I get y. And if I do d plus how much, I get y. Instead of minus 5, instead of going minus this way, how many ticks I have to go the other way? 21. Can everybody see that? Instead of going, how many total ticks are on this circle? 26 ticks. If I go 5 ticks back, is the same as 21 ticks for us because everything with 26 will end up in the same spot. Anything plus 26 is that thing. Any, because if I go 26 ticks, I go exactly where I start. Right? Uh, that's pretty much the whole lecture. No. <laughs> There's more in here. Hold on. Uh, there is a mathematical way to do this. This is the prior first grade stuff. But then mathematicians said, you know, we have another way to represent this stuff. We call it Z26. 0, 1, 2, up to 25. These are remainders. Modulo 26. Remainders work exactly this way. So here's how that happens. <coughs> Any A is 26 times a Q plus an R. Q and R are unique. We already did this theorem, was the integer division theorem. We see there's only one Q and R that works. And R has to be in Z26. In other words, has to be an integer between 0 and 25. This is the important part here, unique. If I do a division, some number at 26, and he does a division at 26, we have to get the same quotient and reminder. There's no way to get two different quotients or two different reminders. Those are unique values. So the way we write this stuff in here, we say 21 plus 5 equal 26, and that is 0 modulo 26. I could say 21 is minus 5 modulo 26. If you get confused about these equations, you go back to the circle. Where is 21? This is 23, 22, 21, right? Where is minus 5? How do I get to minus 5? On the circle, how would you get to minus 5? Yes, somebody. I start at 0, then go back 5 ticks. And I get exactly at 21. What happens if I go from minus 5, the whole circle back again? That's minus how much? I'm at 21, which is minus 5. I go minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, minus 9, da 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 da. Back at 0, I'm going to be at minus 26, right? And I go back, what is this? Minus 27. Minus 27, what is this? Minus 28, minus 29, minus 30, and this will be minus 31. And this one here would be minus 25, minus 24, minus 23, minus 22. So at minus 31, if I keep going negative, what number would I have here at 8? Minus 52, right? That's another 26 ticks that went to 0. And if I go positive the other way from 0, this would be 26, right? And if I go positive again, what would I get in there? 52. 52. And if I go again, the circle, 
70. 70. So that happens here too. These 21, if I go down, I get minus 5. But if I, if I go up from 21, what would be the other number? The next time I reach this peak here. Hands up who, who knows why 47 is here. Up so I can see them, please. So 21 is the Z tick that's in the set. Every tick has a value from this canonical ZN. If I go negative, it's minus 26, minus another 26, minus another 26. If I go positive, that's a plus 26, plus 26, plus 26. So the next one after 41, 47 will be who? How much? Seven. Three. All these values in here, they correspond to only one value in Z26, which is that value. 21. So 21 is the canonical value, but every other integer that passes through this path is 21 plus or minus a bunch of 26s. And that's true for anything. This 13, if I take 26 out of it, I'm going to get minus 13, right? Again, minus 39. If I add 26 to it, I'm going to get? How much do I get if I add 26 to it? 39. Is that right? Yeah. So you can do this for every single tick on this circle, and that's how modulo 26 works. Um, so let's see if you add up two numbers. What do we get? If I do an addition modulo, 26, I get, say, I want to add 17 plus 21 plus 53 mod 26. I say I can do this in two ways. I can do the addition and then take modulo. And you take modulo, you guarantee to get a number in here, because it's a reminder. So. When you take that modulo, you have to get a number between 0 and 25. Or I can do, I say, this is the same as doing it this way. Modulo 26 plus 21, modulo 26 plus 53, modulo 26. And this number, I'm going to take another modulo because it might be out of the range that I need. So let's see, if I add up those numbers, what do I get? Ninety-one. Yeah. Modulo twenty-six. Seventy modulo twenty-six. That's seventeen. Twenty-one modulo twenty-six. That's twenty-one. And fifty-three modulo twenty-six is one. Modulo twenty-six again. Ninety-one modulo twenty-six is how much? Where is ninety-one in here? Or what's the reminder of ninety-one when I divide with twenty-six? The way you do this is 26 times a quotient plus a reminder. So you have to figure out the quotient. How many times 26 fits in 91? Three, that gives me 78, right? So from 78 to 91? So this is gotta be 13. In here, if I add up 17 plus 21, I get 30, eight, Let's say it's 38 first, modulo 26 plus 1. So 38 modulo 26 is what? 12, right? Plus 1. Modulo 26 works, because 12 plus 1 is 13. So this modulo operation, when you add things, you can take the modulos anytime you want. You can add them up and take the modulo, or take modulos on parts and add them up, and they take more modulos. As long as in the end you end up with a number in here, that's going to be correct. Right? The same thing works for multiplication. Um, how about 40 times 39 
uh, I'm going to change the modulo here. I'm going to say n equal 11. So I'm going to do this modulo 11. Everybody realizes 26 is just a random number here. I could do it 26, 47, 11, 2, 3, 4, any, any modulo I want. So if I do modulo 11, can I say that this is 40 modulo 11 times 39 modulo 11? How much is 40 times 39? If I do the, the multiplication first. How much do I get? <coughs> now I take the modulus. How much is 40 modulo 11? What's the reminder here? And 39 modulo 11? So 1560 um, is what modulo 11? Is uh, 11 times what plus what? Let's divide the 156 by 11. It, it's, it fits one time, right? That's the 11. I get the fourth, right? In 46, four times. And then 4 times 11 is 44. Out of 46, I get 20. 20 fits 1, right? And then, what's the reminder? 9? And then 7 times 6 is? 42. Modulo 11. So this is 9. The answer has got to be 9 in here. Because every time you get 11 times an integer plus 9, if the 9 is in the set, how much is the 11? 0, 1, 2, up to, what's the last element in here? Yeah. Every time I get 11 times something plus a value in there, that value is the remainder. Back to this theorem here. If I manage to write this way, this is now 11 for me, not 26. Any quotient, quotient doesn't matter. This 141 here doesn't matter what it is. What matters is the reminder. So if I get this to be 9, how much is 42 modulo 11? 42 is 11 times 3 plus 9. So additions and multiplications, you can take the modulo whenever it suits you. Of course, it's going to suit you to take it on small numbers. Who wants to do 40 times 39, right? Much easier to take the modulo first. You have much smaller numbers here, right? So the whole point of these modulo operations, if you take the modulo quickly, you don't end up with big numbers. So I want to draw another circle here for 11. Let's draw it here. How is that circle for 11 looks like? Just so you see more circles. I'm serious. Zero, one, two, what's the opposite of zero? Plus one, plus one. Uh, five in here. Zero, one, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. You got it right? Yeah. Should put them in, inside or outside. I skip something? Just uh, the five is in the five. All right. So what happens on this circle? If I take eleven out from zero, I go backwards. Where am I going to end up here? At minus 11, right? And if I take it again, minus 22. But if I go the other way from 0, I end up at plus 11, plus 22. How about, say, in 7? If I go backwards, what's the other number? Minus 4. And if I go again backwards, I get? But if I go the other way, 7 plus 11, I get? 18, and again? All these numbers are the same remainder. They all of them are exactly seven. 
So if somebody asks you for a remainder or a canonical value is 11, you can't say 18 or 29 or minus 4 or 15. You have to say 7. Okay? And I want to draw one more circle. One that's very dear to us computer scientists. I want to draw the circle that corresponds to a power of 2. They say I have 8 is 2 to the 3. How that circle looks like. This is zero. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then Z, Z, uh, eight is of course zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to write this a little bit different. I'm going to say this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Right? So 0, 0, 0 comes here. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Remember when I said as binary numbers that we need to implement the negative ones? Because we got the positive ones. If we do unsigned positives, this is indeed the range. The range is Z8, which is the range from 0 to 7. But if I do positives, uh, sorry, sign. I want to get positives and negatives. Positives will be 0, 1, 2, 3. They have the first bit equal 0. Negatives will be the other ones, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I'm going to put those in quotes because they're not negative. They will be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Those representations, they have the first bit equal 1. So these values will stay 0, 1, 2, 3, positive range. But what values are those in this range? So what is I want minus 1 to be here, obviously. Where is minus 1? I want to make this circle work just the same this circle works and just the same this circle works. Where should I place the minus 1 in here to make this work properly? Yes. Here, this got to be the minus 1. And then this is minus 2. And this is minus 3, and this is? We got right? Minus 4. <laughs> so the only part that doesn't work is here. Right? You can see how if I add 1 to here, I get to the next one. Is that correct? If I add one value to here, I get to this one. If I add 1 to minus 1, I get to here. If I add 1, works fine. The only problem is here. How, how does this thing happen? If you have 0, 1, 1, why if you add 1 from 3, you get to minus 4? Right? That, that doesn't seem proper. So this is the how the two complements work. And uh, there's a formula in the textbook and in the slides how to transform decimals into negative with two's complement. Please do not read that formula. <laughs> it's the fastest way to get mistakes. There are three rules. Nobody can remember them. Very easy to get stuff wrong. The only formula you need is I want to transform a number in negative. How much do I need to get to add to zero? 
the reason I know this is this is minus two is that if I add two ones to it, I get zero zero zero. How do I see that? One one zero plus one zero. That's the two. I get zero zero zero. This is overflow. It doesn't compute. So that's how I know this is minus two because if I add two to it, I get to zero. So I don't have to remember the formula from the textbook. The only problem what you have to figure out as a computer scientist, how does this happen? How computers can deal with part, this part in here? You, what you have to understand is computers, when they have only three bits, or four bits, or six bits, or eight bits, they ignore completely what com comes out of those bits. Whatever the result they get on those three bits that you allocate, that stays. The overflow gets erased before it's written. They, if you have only three bits, the the next bits are not written in memory because they never overwrite whatever's in there. So if I know the result on three bits, it's only those three bits that matter. That's what makes the two complement system work. So this effectively is a modulo two to the n when n is the number of bits. That's another great way to do two, two's complement correct. If you know you have eight bits, everything is modulo 256 in there. It's, you know, around the circle. So uh, that's what I have. We're going to talk much more about modulo arithmetic, and we're going to talk much more about the ciphers. Uh, one more thing. The other section will have different notes for the number theory. So there's slides in the regular sections that like I've already seen. Those are the same slides you've seen before, but your required notes for reading will be those notes, which they don't have. Now, there's more in here than what you need, so I'll have to trim it down. But in terms of studying, you'll have to study from these notes, not from the slides that are going to be available from the other instructions. <laughs> I'm going to follow this note. So it's much easier for you to go home and check those notes than some random slides. But of course, you can. You can do anything you want.